final end, which is there's going to be a panel discussion of how did COVID reshape the marketing funnel. The COVID pandemic has pushed the world for the marketing industry more than any sector. Marketeers had to rewrite the rules to reach out to the consumers. Exploring these changes in the world of marketing, up next we have a panel discussion wherein I'm pleased to in welcome Shivam Ranjan, the marketing head, Motorola India, Dipali Nair, CMO, IBM India and South Asia, Saurabh Verma, CMO, INOX Leisure Limited, and Samyukta Ganesh Ayer, head of marketing, Baskin Robbins. Also, the session chair of this panel discussion is going to be Vani Gupta Dandia, founder, Cherry Peach Slum, a growth partner, who will be the session chair. Thank you to all our incredible panelists for giving us your valuable time and being a part of our panel discussion at the E4M Conclave. With this, I'd like to share the stage and screen to our eminent panelists for taking it forward. Thank you for joining us. Vani, Hi, everyone. Hi. Can you, can you all hear me? Hi, Vani. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. OK, fantastic. Can't hear you, Deepali. Can you hear me now? Yes. OK, good. Yes. Okay, so thank you everyone and thank you for that introduction, Bhavna. Our topic is about how the marketing funnel has changed in COVID times. And I'm sure there's a lot that's been said away. But I'm going to go to the Pali strict. And I know the Pali has to log off early, so I'm going to uh, get, try and get the best of her as quickly as possible. The Pali, tell us, you're with IBM, you have a long stint with financial services. And I know you won many awards internally. But before I come to those, help us understand how has marketing changed for you pre-COVID pre and post-COVID? I think pre-COVID itself, IBM's uh, marketing oh. efforts used to be uh, purely digital. We hardly used any uh, print and television. But a large part of our marketing mix used to be uh, offline events. And those have turned uh, totally digital. So we are doing only uh, digital events now because physical is not possible. That's the one change that has happened. Second is a change that has happened on the consumer side, the way they're taking decisions uh, in the B2B world, for example, how many people take part in a decision that plays a very important role. So that has changed. The type of decisions that they want to take now because of the cash flow issues that you know most organizations are looking at have also changed. So we had to relook at our product offerings mm -hmm. itself. Uh, you know, we changed the uh, we changed which portfolio offerings we would actually go out with first. You know, we still were supporting a lot of our clients uh, on uh, some of the decisions that they're going to make in the long term. But third and the most important thing, Vani, for us was that a lot of our clients were essential services. They were financial services themselves. They were banks. They were telcos. Uh, you know, distribution of LPG. These are all the kind of stuff that you really, uh, you know, uh, needed to support. And we support their infra, we support their security, we support their systems. And I think our first task was really to ensure that our clients' businesses mm -hmm. were running. And I think that's really paid off for us mm -hmm. in the long term. We've actually improved on our NPS scores, you know, uh, uh, so on and so forth, you know. So in a long-term relationship business, uh, taking care of your existing clients also matters. That's a very big one. Absolutely. Dipali, tell me exactly this. From where you left off just now, how did you keep your clients' businesses running? What did you do that was fundamentally different? Because that's a very important I think I would, not, I, would not take, uh, I would not take credit as marketing for that. I think uh, the credit goes to our, uh, you know, in the world of IT and technology, what is called delivery hmm. teams. Uh, you know, uh, I think it was the relationship and the delivery teams who really, uh, I think, uh, uh, developed a new bone, you know. So, for example, there is a government client of ours, one of the state governments, you know, Andhra Pradesh government, you know, they wanted something developed very, very quickly for, uh, you know, intimation of COVID, you know, so that's what we did. Uh, one of the, uh, one of our clients has 27,000 outlets across the country and they wanted to do free distribution of the meals. Their app really wasn't geared towards mm -hmm. that, but they wanted to develop that feature in the app. And we, we delivered it to them in a matter of, you know, uh, I think six weeks or something, right? Their downloads went from, uh, you know, X 
uh, to three x within a period of two months. You know, so supporting the infra and the systems for that, and developing these new features. So these are just two examples that I'm sharing. With you. There are a lot of other POCs that we've done for the government. You know, without asking questions. You know, really doing it free. Uh, for them to explore some things that they want to do for future, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they were there are stories we we call them heroes inside IBM. There are hero stories where our uh, people volunteered, you know, to stay in the BCP uh, uh, locations for our key banking clients, for example, mm -hmm. right? To ensure that India actually digitally transacted, you know, when we transact digitally. We don't think about the level of organizations and the level of people who make it happen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, IBM was, people were really part of that. And we, you can't coerce people into doing it. It's self-motivated for them to say that, yes, it's COVID. And during this period, I'm going to stay 15 days away, days and nights away from my family and actually support the client that we have. Beautiful. So, you know, those are the kind of stories, you know, that we have. Uh, you know, yeah. So, Deepali, this was about supporting our existing clients. But yes. hey, since this panel discussion is also about the marketing funnel per se, what to do differently to broaden the funnel at the top? Because that would be the biggest challenge that all, all marketers were left plumbing with and all of us learned a new. So what do we do at the top of the funnel? Uh, may I request something? Uh, I think, Nazia, could I request you to put your... Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Tell Thanks, me. Nazia. Uh, Vani, the answer to that is not just top of the funnel. You created efficiencies, uh, you know, at all funnel matrix also because the end results matter. In IBM, I actually take on a target, which is, you know, the uh, end business target and, you know, what percentage marketing contributes to that target. And that's very hard coded and we uh, get measured on that. And that is really something that, uh, you know, we have to deliver. But from the point of view of the question that you asked me on top of the funnel, you know, it's very interesting that you asked me that. And uh, you and I were discussing sometime back that in the offline world, when I was doing large events, you know, in India, they would typically mean 500 people event, 700 people event, you know, uh, the largest event that we did was some 1500 people in the last two years. But during COVID, we've actually done digital events where 4,500 people have participated. And from the on-demand content perspective, this number went up to 8,000 for that event. We very regularly are now doing 1,100, 1,500, 2,500 people events. So that is really expanding the top of the funnel. So on one side, we are doing that. On the second side, we are also doing very, very small events that we didn't do earlier because in the offline world, they'd be very expensive to do. So we don't mind doing roundtables with three people, four people. That's something that, we're again, we're doing a lot of that, uh, uh, you know, just to give you a flavor of, uh, you know, what is happening. On the second side, how do you engage the audiences? You know, so the brief to my team really was that if my 16-year-old can be engaged on gaming forever, and if he's not giving me grief about stepping outside outside the home, then can we create th those kind of experiences when we're looking at the digital format for our clients? So I think both on the innovation front and on the top of the funnel reach front, you know, so if you look at reach and engagement, that's really what widened the uh, funnel. I have I have so many questions of you, Deepali. Yes. I, I know I've got the other panelists waiting, but very quickly. Uh, sorry, I wanted to ask you. So um, when you do such large scale events in the Corona world, the big question is how do you get participation? Obviously, you created events which your audiences found great value in. And Creating value in this COVID era with digital experiences has been most challenging for marketers. Yes. What did you do with your events that created that magic? So, Vani, I think you've got to motivate the team to ensure they are ahead of the game. Even today, I had a meeting with my team where I spoke to them and I said, all the formula that's worked for you in the last three months, imagine that it's not going to work for you in the next three months. Okay? So, we've really looked at it quarter on quarter. Right. So we really so we our first set of events started happening April, May, June. Right. And then in July, August, September, we did something else in October, November, December. We've done something else. And I'm again motivating them and saying, look, the same things that you tried earlier ain't going to work because digital fatigue is becoming a reality even more so. Whatever you introduce, somebody else copies. In fact, my vendors only take it to other, uh, you know, clients and uh, copy paste the whole thing. So by the time we come back to doing something in the next quarter, it becomes, you know, old news. But, you know, I just want to narrate one incident to you. Back in October 2019, okay, 
I had sat down with my team to do planning for 2020. And we had said that in two years or three years time, completely digital events are going to be a reality. COVID hadn't happened. Nobody knew COVID was going to happen. So in February of 2020, when COVID had not happened is when we really did our large 3,500 people event. Okay, because my team said, let's plan for the future and let's learn for the future. So this staying ahead of the curve without telling the whole world in terms of what are the new experiments that we're going to do, that are we going to unfold, you come to our events and see them. Uh, okay, but I think uh, that's what really uh, matters. Can you motivate the team into thinking afresh and into changing very quickly? I mean, imagine going to a successful campaign manager in your team or a successful event manager in your team saying, buddy, you delivered everything that I asked for you two months ago, but I'm sorry, I'm not buying that again, you know? So I think uh, that's that's really the challenge that I think the CMOs should adopt and adapt where their teams are buying into this whole space of pivot and agility. But I just want to give you two examples for which we've got awards. Okay, so mm -hmm. for example, we were doing a security summit. And mm -hmm. in that, uh, you know, we uh, uh, akin to the CIO getting his organization prepared, we had some gamification did from a Kalari Petuk perspective, how a martial artist prepares and what happens to the environment. So that was very well received. Uh, we got inspired by Mario, uh, the old game that used to be, knowing very well that our audiences would relate to that, um, you know, what age group they are. So that it's very important to make those connections. Uh, so we did almost like a money heist game, uh, you know, that was done. Uh, so those are the gamification experiences. And we did that back in April and May, not now. You know, so it may in hindsight to everybody say, yeah, you know, it's been done and others have done it. The thing is that at IBM, we've been ahead of the curve in terms of doing any gamification or experiences, you know, uh, uh, with our clients. Fantastic. Really, really helpful, Deepali. Lovely learning from you. Thank you, Mani. Let me now come to Saurabh. Saurabh, I can imagine you must have had it really tough. You've had long years in filmmaking and you're now with Inox. And we all know, much as we're very eager to go see movies on the big screen, the fact is that that's one thing that has been most adversely affected. The cinema business has been amongst the most adversely affected. How has life changed for you? So I guess uh, I can start with the fact that uh, cinema is basically the whole business. If you see, it's divided into 52 weeks and you had four to five films releasing every week. And there was massive chaos because we were breaking records, cinemas are opening and we were running at a very fast speed. Suddenly, you know, a speed breaker came or a break came and something happened and we immediately stopped. And the moment it stopped, it wasn't just the the, the pandemic attack or, or whatever it was, but also the whole, uh, you know, the mental torture which happened that, you know, cinemas are going down and they're not going to work and things are going to change. And, and it was mentally very, very taxing. And a business which operates 365 days a year, suddenly, uh, you know, we stopped making money. So it wasn't that easy to handle everything. But I think there's some silver linings in, uh, in in the pandemic itself as well. Like I said, that when we stopped, we stopped running and we stopped immediately with the break. Uh, what also happened is that uh, whatever urgent there was, I mean, everything took a backseat and we started thinking about the uh, important things. So what has happened is that, you know, uh, the way you market things, the way you see things, uh, a very important thing is that the human resource became very, very fragile because, you know, people were fearing they lose their jobs, but they also became important because we had to motivate the team and things like that. Uh, perception management uh, in terms of, you know, handling brand, brand managers or people who advertise in a cinema changed to data management. So, you know, a lot of things have changed and we're still struggling with a lot of things. And since the pandemic has, you know, uh, just uh, uh, broken in, uh, I think every day it's been a learning thing and every day we are evolving uh, as a as a marketer, as a as an entrepreneur, and as a cinema management company, so a lot of interesting things, and every region has its own story. Tell us a little more about this data bit that you just spoke about, Saurabh. When you said you were using data, tell us how did you use data, and what kind of data did you use? So in our business, we were all traditional. I mean, if you see the whole film business, they they heavily rely on print advertising. They rely on posters on streets, hoardings, and uh, all things traditional. And once this pandemic attacked, uh, what happened was that, you know, we started questioning each and everything that if you compare the print circulation to a data, uh, digital, this thing, uh, you can't compare both because one is a C and one is kind of can be accounted for, but it's not hundred percent accurate, which is print. 
so what started happening was that you know a lot of people who had only 5 to 10% of their marketing budget as digital marketing suddenly it became 50 to 100% in terms of digital a lot of innovative ideas started coming in and and this whole perception of ott and cinema battle and everything maybe it's you know spruced up the whole conversation but the actual fact is that this moment swiggy and zomato have come in the appetite of consuming food from outside has grown similarly when ott has come in the appetite to consume more content has grown so people are watching content while they are traveling they're at home wherever and that will is positively affecting the film business as well uh, we can see that with the kind of queries we're getting and whatever films that have opened till now the kind of reaction people are giving I think it's it. They, uh, uh, what has happened is that the boundaries have faded. People are wanting go global content. The languages have faded. So film thing, films like Narcos in OTT or a film like Master in the uh, uh, silver screen, people are willing to watch it. So what we've done is we we start tabulating data now. We don't think, sell physical tickets. Everything is on your phone. So we know exactly who's our audience which are coming, male, female. Uh, what is the kind of demographics they're working on. And we are trying to analyze the thing. And now the biggest challenge in the forthcoming things is going to be, it's it may be easy to collect the data, but it's difficult to slice and dice and understand what the audience wants. And that's the uh, struggle I think everybody in India is doing and we are also part of it. What a beautiful point to make, Saurabh, to think that in denial, there would be hope for a huge resurgence. The yeah. fact that, like you said, because we've been watching a lot of content on ODT, our appetite to watch movies has grown. That's actually so true. I mean, I was looking up, uh, you know, movies in the India International Film Festival, and you're absolutely right. A lot of us are now discussing uh, movies of the kind that perhaps we weren't at one time, because now we're all, uh, you know, we're all, we're making friends by what do you watch? on ODG. So I can I can quite relate to what you're saying. And the pandemic has broken the formula. There's no formula now. So that's mm -hmm. what it is. People, not just not just the marketers, but also the consumers willing to see out of the box. So that's something which is very, very interesting. Fabulous. And this I'm assuming Deepali is something that you would have also seen because you went online in a big way, you would also be able to use data at a much broader level at a scale level of the kind that perhaps you weren't able to at, at Tony, our time. In, uh, in our case, uh, I think we were data driven even earlier on. Uh, I don't think our usage of data dramatically went up uh, in the context of pre-COVID or post-COVID uh, because that's we are very, very data driven. And I told you, for example, uh, when you look at the funnel matrix, every point uh, you know we we measure in terms of the yield that we're getting at every point of the funnel down to the bottom and various ways uh, for example whether we've just touched the contact or is it direct you know uh, through and through a marketing funnel that is being used you know so on and so forth so i would say that i think being data driven already that didn't change much uh, we continue to remain the same level of high data driven you know marketing decision making organization Thank you for that, Deepali. Samrutha, let me come to you. You're with Baskin Robbins. I want to know, for you, when people stopped going to Baskin Robbins outlets, and I know I have a little boy at home, and I know what it's like to go to an ice cream parlor and you know look at all of the different colors of ice cream and decide, am I going to you know, am I going to opt for the blue or the uh, or the strawberry or whatever else? When COVID hit, how did you make sure that Baskin Robbins, which was this this iconic ice cream go to place, how did you take this experience online? How do you make sure that consumers and whether you wish to speak, uh, you know, specifically on Baskin Robbins or even in general? Given that a lot of brands have had to transition online, how do you think an essentially offline brand can take that experience which it creates in the offline world seamlessly to the online world? Yeah, so hi Vani, thanks. It's an interesting question. And uh, like you said, I don't think this is something that, uh, you know, only ice cream players were plagued with. I think this was a situation that many 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 brands and many many uh, you know sectors found themselves in where um, there was an 
immediate need to kind of uh, do a crash course in digital marketing i think even saurabh was saying they've traditionally been offline and then suddenly everyone had to uh, learn how to survive online and sell online so i think dipali was also talking about the fact that a marketer's role is no longer restricted to just uh, you know building the upper funnel metrics and you know just you know talking about brand building etc suddenly everyone had to uh, switch through the funnel to actually reach out to advocates to it i mean everything got rejected right uh, to actually leading to purchase directly um, the consumers didn't have time uh, organizations didn't have time um, it has just happened and the beauty of it is as human beings i think we are uh, you know created for adaptation and adoption and um, i think that's what has happened across uh, i don't ever envisage a world now where we'll not be doing digital uh, where online will not be a very very intrinsic and not that 10% part of your budget but it's going to be a very core part of even if everything goes back to normal and uh, you know let's hope it does uh, i don't think digit- digital is here to stay it's not going off anywhere whether it's for uh, you know building your own ecom or uh, i think sort of touched upon the fact that there are aggregators that you know have been around uh, but now have played a bigger role like aggregators marketplaces especially in the food industry uh, like never before um people have always bought even something as mundane as vegetable buying is a big thing for all of us right like uh, most people would like to go and touch and feel and then uh, you know break that bindi and check you know if it's fresh enough and then haggle for that you know the free curry leaves that come with it etc to actually now shopping for it online on blind trust even on places like amazon which had never catered to vegetables before i think it's a whole new behavior that everyone has learned adapted to realized how easy it is i remember dipali saying that um, you know work from home is going to be the norm forever now and it's not not really i think one of the previous discussions i remember you saying that right like it's going to be something that all of us have learned that was again new behavior so it literally impacted every aspect of our life if i have to just narrow it down to brand building i think that's where the role of marketing comes in from offline to online there needs to be consistency in messaging consistency in look consistency in feel across very all clear. media it's very yeah. tempting when you go online to become very topical very moment marketing there's this whole fomo of you know like oh there's something trending your brand needs to be a part of it but i think as marketers you need to take a step back and put on your brand hat first and the minute you do that the brand will speak for itself you know whether you're relevant or not relevant to that particular trend that's happening and then you need to decide whether you want to be a part of it or you you don't want to force fit relevance because there's so much democratization of content that's happening online that if your brand has a tone of voice and you're lucky that your brand has a tone of voice you better stick to it and as market and as marketers it's kind of your responsibility to ensure that you first you know don't go media agnostic uh, you have to go media agnostic uh, my bad but you have to ensure that the brand comes first and then the medium kind of becomes second and the my other point is that the same consumers who are there offline are the same people who are shopping online as well so why would you suddenly change your messaging or suddenly change anything that you're doing online just because you know the same person why would you suddenly speak to that person differently absolutely you make it sound so easy samukta but it's something that uh is a very very big deal how do you take that experience seamlessly online with consistent messaging with consistent look and feel not being carried away by the medium but making sure that the consumers who were shopping for me earlier are able to see exactly the sa- same brand that they derive joy from in the offline world is uh, is something that we all still are learning i think and there are there aren't too many brands today that i think are doing a great job of this but thank you so much for that samrita i'll come back to you i want to pick on shivam shivam you're essentially uh from the internet world in a way uh tell us uh, tell us for motorola how did life change pre and post perfect so yeah we are we are basically from the tech world and i think uh, we've been fortunate in the way that uh, you know while most industries right from hospitality and luxury have been impacted 
I think the tech world has actually benefited from the from the pandemic in the way that people are relying now more and more on technology products and technology uh, services to be able to connect with each other, to be able to, uh, you know, uh, amplify or get uh, their needs uh, serviced. So I think that that uh, shift in consumer behavior has actually been for technology products and technology services. And I think that's, again, something that is going to stay because consumers are more and more not just consuming content for entertainment on their tech products and uh, and platforms, but they're also using it for their services, like, for example, educating children from home. I think that's become a norm nowadays where you need tech products to, to ensure you're able to do that successfully. Even health tips, health uh, appointments with the doctors, et cetera. So everything, and not just that, shopping, like we said, I mean, uh, channel wise, I mean, uh, in terms of the product availability, online channel has become extremely critical. And I think uh, online shopping definitely has grown during the COVID times. And we at Motorola, I mean, specifically from the consumer uh, mobile and consumer electronics side, we feel that we were actually heavier digitally uh, right from the beginning, although we have strong presence in offline. However, we feel that, uh, you know, the consumer behavior has shifted towards online, but there are still opportunities which are uh, in the form of needs which have been suppressed. So, for example, uh, consumers today, uh, you know, while they are they are bound to buy online because of the need to stay confined, the, 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 the fear that they have towards uh, crowded places, etc., they do have a desire and a need to experience products, right? Especially high-end products. So, for example, uh, Motorola launched the world's first foldable clamshell product, which was the Motorola Razor, uh, very recently. Uh, so, in 2020, in March, we launched the Motorola Razor, which is uh, the foldable skin product, uh, and uh, that that actually is such a revolutionary product that consumers have never seen it before. Now, to exp- expect a consumer to go ahead and buy it online directly, while you can make it available online. To expect a consumer to go straight ahead, straight away, and buy a product like that online is a challenge, which is why retail is uh, is important. And hence, I think there is a need for those experiences. And now, uh, with these uh, consumer needs, which are suppressed at this point of time, why channels are performing? I think there are opportunities for channels to also evolve to deliver, say, those consumer needs. So, for example, the the I mean, we anticipate that possibility of AR, VR experiences coming into online shopping to be, to be able to give consumers the opportunity to effectively experience the product that they can't possibly at retail today. And similarly, at retail, there is need for innovation. So for example, with the Razer, the product, which was definitely something priced at you know one lakh plus and affordable screen, consumers definitely want to see, check out the form factor and see how it, how it behaves. So we definitely, for our offline retail, ensured that we were giving virtual demos to consumers. So that is something that we started at our, at our retail outlet. And this was something new that, that we had to you know, think from scratch and immediately deploy. So I think it's important for brands to be extremely flexible and agile uh, in, in, in case of this pandemic. And you know, it's important for us to be able to enable or cater to certain consumer needs and behaviors which have been suppressed due to the current uh, you know, uh, impacts of the pandemic. And, uh, and, uh, and hence, uh, you know, uh, in fact, if you ask me about the consumer needs, right, I mean, uh, especially at the peak of the pandemic, uh, and typical to Maslow's hierarchy, whenever there's a crisis, the consumer needs move downwards, right? So consumers move towards safety, security, and the basic needs. Uh, and the need for uh, belonging, you know, uh, is, is stifled, because that's where you're confined completely, and you don't have friends, family, uh, and, and the capability to go out. So again, that's an opportunity. Right? And, and digital as a platform is, is a, gives you that opportunity to be able to deliver those experiences to consumer, to connect them to consumers, to in fact, uh, I personally believe, and I think Kent was also mentioning a short while back, uh, consumers don't want to see, and in terms of how brands communicate, consumers don't want to see a mirror reflection of themselves all the time, right, at this point of time. And hence, I believe from a marketing communication perspective also, it is an opportunity for us as marketeers to communicate to consumers, to give them that uh, view of, uh, you know, uh, a behavior that's, that also makes them smile, that also makes them feel engaged. Uh, yeah, Dipali, I think is long you off. Yeah, sure. So uh, thank you, Dipali. It was a pleasure to hear you. So I think it's a it's a tremendous opportunity for us to uh, also look at these 
these behavior patterns and cater to them in different ways. And like I said, you know, the sense of belonging is another opportunity, uh, which which we can basically incorporate in our communication in the way we communicate. Give give consumers something to smile about instead of telling them what what's wrong with them. Uh, look at uh, you know experiences that they are unable to uh, you know explore at this point of time and try to look at technology and ways of technology to deliver those to them. So I think these are some of the points which I think are absolutely critical for us as a consumer electronics and uh, consumer uh, you know, mobile products player, uh, even these times. And I think while uh, the, 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 the turn of this pandemic has been helpful for tech products and, and tech services in general, I think there is still a lot of scope for us to also deliver these. For example, every channel needs those innovations, even online, you know, while it has evolved significantly and it has grown significantly, I think there's still opportunity for the channel to also evolve and deliver those experiences and for us to communicate to consumers differently, to be able to ensure that we are able to grab that mind share that we need to, especially in the times when, when there's so much media noise, right? I mean, everybody is moving towards digital, even traditionally, like Saurabh said, or Samyukta said, I think even traditionally offline, uh, brands are moving towards a lot of uh, advertising on digital and, and you will so see Shikhan, that. Let me interrupt you here. I think you've made two actually very important points and I want to make sure that these two important points are captured and we're able to take this discussion from here. Sure. What you said was that because of the dramatic shift to the digital world, even the offline world was forced to reinvent itself and yes. in fact, the uh, the huge wave of digital actually even forced the offline world to improve the kind of experiences that they themselves could provide to the consumer even through these times. Like you, said, you have this new foldable phone and I as a consumer even, I've been seeing ads of your foldable phone it sounds so, 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 it sounds miraculous. Like one can't imagine how can a phone possibly fold. But you're absolutely right. Ideally, I would like to go to a store and touch and feel and see how it works in order to be able to buy it. So I can imagine that the, the you know, your retail outlets must be grappling with how do they bring this experience to the consumer. Absolutely. The second point that you made was about the suppressed consumer need, beautifully stated. Now, in terms of addressing this, like you said, you know, you were talking about the Maslow's the hierarchy of needs, etc. There's been so much said during Corona times about being, about all of us as marketers providing content to consumers, which is not just transactional to say, hey, buy me, my business is also tanking, please, I too need revenue, but being empathetic with consumers and making sure that we're able to relate with how they're feeling and provide experiences, provide context uh, you know, to our buying experience in their in the context of their own life. Anyone, this is open to anybody in the panel. Would you like to talk about what role did content play? What kind of content were you looking at creating during COVID times to so come across? As I'd business? like to. I'd like to. I'd like to answer this question, and somebody else can follow. So yes. we are in the content business. We are into the cinema business. So there are two uh, parts of this question. One is not actually the question, but I let me address it. See, when you have a business which is driven by content way, which cannot be moved back to a home, people mm -hmm. have to come to a cinema to watch a film. The most difficult thing was that once the pandemic, you know, uh, the lo and lockdown ended and, you know, we wanted to bring back people, there was no content left. There's nothing left. The, the films were not available, things like that. And we created a campaign which was revolving around the cinema halls. And we said that, you know, you can do your private screening, you can watch your old films, you can have your own weddings, you can propose to your girlfriend and things like that. And we created videos and content which was very consumer centric. And the moment we used to get a reaction from somebody saying, hey, why can't, can I do this? For example, we've done a Roka ceremony in a cinema in Lucknow. We've done a fan club, Rajnikan fan club screening in uh, South. Uh, we've done uh, a Marathi Mandal screening in Baroda, which is not a Marathi centric market. Or we've done a Durga Puja in the in a in a cinema in our Bengal. So what happened was that the content was derived with the way the consumer was reacting and the way they were working upon. And this is fresh data. This wasn't something which was cap could have been captured in a digital way. You had to entice the audience by saying that you know uh, book a you know book a banquet, book an auditorium, or do a private screening 
or make your own private world and it's safe, hygienic and everything. And with these simple words and simple videos which are animated and things like that, the consumer caught on to it. So I guess there's no fixed formula to create a video. I think what you need to do is you need to keep your eye, ears very close to the digital world because there's so much of noise, you tend to go wrong. And you know, whatever works out of, you know, the 100 things you do, the 10 or 15 which works, if you learn from it and you record it, and that's the biggest problem with companies, at least the ones which I'm working around with, is that they don't capture that, you know, that reaction and everything, because by the time you start your next campaign, you've forgotten what you've done in the past or people have moved on and things like that. So, and the other thing is that the consumer behavior is rapidly changing. So the same post could have not given a, got a reaction maybe pre-pandemic, but today people are getting digital digitally uh, very, very savvy. Actors, you know, ground level activities, uh, which used to be the major primary promotion for uh, actors and stars and everything. And now they've come digital and they, they do digital uh, sessions and do a meet and greet digitally and everything. So their videos, their, their banters, their quarrels, their fabricated quarrels, everything becomes content. And, you know, that's how uh, things are becoming very, very dynamic and spreading across not just the uh, cities in India or states in India, but all across the world. So it's and not a or a Delhi or whatever. Anybody and everybody can watch it. And uh, so the, the, the spread has increased and uh, so is the content. I can't imagine what it must have been for you like. And, and the fact that, you know, you just stated all of these examples of the many things that you did at cinema halls, that must have taken a lot of agility. And it must have taken a lot of discussion as well inside, you know, within your uh, internal leadership team to figure what can we do with our cinema halls? How can we bring in new streams of revenue? And you've gone ahead and done that very quickly. Besides taking yeah, advantage- so around was one. And the second was what to do because there's so much of confusion. And the yeah. moment you ask advice, you have 10,000 ideas, but which is going to work? We really don't yeah. know. So exactly. today what is working may not work two weeks from now. So even yeah. that, we are constantly on our toes. And I think that's made us all, not just marketers, but students. We are all students, we are still learning and let's hope we'll be better prepared if anything, uh, I mean, for the future and whatever comes next. Fabulous, fabulous. Anything you'd like to add here, Samyukta, on being empathetic or using content better to be able to, you know, build a better relationship with your existing consumers? Yeah. So, uh, first off, uh, thanks, Aurab, for sharing what you did. I think that was like very, very innovative and uh, interesting use of uh, the cinema halls as well. Um, I think uh, Vani for me, uh, just two things uh, are very, very important. I think, and that's something that uh, has kind of happened during the pandemic. Uh, and again, that's very relevant to all brands. Um, you know, one is like you rightly said, empathy. I think brands that are empathetic brands that have developed. Uh, I saw I'm assuming you're leaving. Yes, yes. I, I just, yeah. Is that okay? I'm very sorry, but uh, there's something which is... No, don't worry. Don't worry. I'm just going to take Samyukta and if there's anything that Shivam would like to add and we'll open it up to uh, question answers from the audience after. Thank you but so much. If you much. need to run away, feel free. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Saurabh. Thanks. Yeah, so Vani coming back, I think empathy, very, very important, very key to, I think every brand uh, has developed that very emotional side and especially during the pandemic it's very important to kind of resonate with what the audience wants and uh, I think Shivam mentioned that it's not about mirroring the audience but it's about actually understanding what do they uh, want and then uh, and also health became very important safety became very important hygiene became very important so if those were probably number three or number four in the consideration uh, set of things that people were looking at before uh, quality suddenly became the very first parameter uh, more than anything else. So the content had to also had to kind of reflect that very, very clearly. I think the second thing is probably the easier bit, but again, very difficult to maintain, uh, you know, the, the attention span of a millennial apparently right now is eight seconds, lesser than a goldfish's uh, attention span. So how do you be uh, as entertaining as possible? So I think the two E's, empathy and entertainment are the two, two big things that is very, very relevant uh, from a content standpoint. Very, very well said, both empathy and entertainment. Anything you would like to add to that, Shivam? 
No, I think that's uh, nicely said. So, like I said, I mean, while it's important for consumers to enjoy and have fun, it's also important for the brands to be genuine, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. where the empathy aspect comes in. You know, Absolutely. you can't be flippant. Absolutely. You can't be, uh, you know, uh, slapstick at these times. You have to be genuine. You have to be realistic. You have to be relevant while yeah. also giving content that is not mirroring their lifestyle. So, I, I completely agree with that. Fabulous. We have only two panelists left now apart from me. So I think this is a good time to quickly take it to uh, the audience. Uh, Samyukta also has to leave. Thanks, Samyukta, for joining us. Uh, Thank you. E, e for M, what would you like us to do? Should we, um, should we all say bye or would you like Shivam to take questions? No. Bani, I think, uh, yeah, Avani, I think that in an interest, like since all our panelists uh, did have prior engagements, I don't want to put uh, the spot on uh, Shivam <laughs> on, uh, for all the questions. But I, I guess, you know, we did keep answering the questions while they were coming, Vani. You were very kind to do the audience questions, which were directed to these speakers also during the session. So I think uh, with this, I just like, Vani, uh, firstly, for you to do some concluding remarks and also post that I could request Shivam on the same. Over to you, Vani. No, so I just want to say that I think it's been a huge learning experience for all of us. We never thought that we'd use content in this way. I work with a lot of my clients and uh, one of the first things that uh, we're all faced with is how do we prospect with consumers? We were also, you know, one of the panelists talked about how earlier digital was always a single digit, um, you know, it, it you never spent more than single digits budget on digital, but that has dramatically changed because we don't have any other options. And, um, and we know consumers are spending all of their time on mobile. So I think we will only continue to evolve. And I absolutely agree with what Shivam said. It's not just learning in the online world. Actually, this new era has forced all of the offline worlds also to reinvent. We all know the kind of advertising that print is doing right now to stay relevant. We all know what companies are doing in order to also better use other media, including physical interactions, to make sure that there is seamlessness between physical and the online world. That's all I have to say. Anything you'd like to add, Shivam, and then... Absolutely, Vani. I think I would just like to add to the fact that it's very important for us to be agile and flexible as brands, as marketeers, as agencies, as media vehicles. Everybody needs to reinvent, uh, reinvent themselves and adapt to it really quickly because the standard target consumer that we had, you know, drawn out the pen portrait for, uh, that's changed. I mean, the, the consumer behavior has changed. The consumer touch points have changed. And, uh, you know, some of them are for the better, some of them for uh, uh, maybe for the worse. But in between there is an opportunity. Uh, and I, I, I personally believe that I'm very optimistic about that opportunity. If we are, if we are uh, uh, capable enough to listen to the consumers at this point of time, I think consumer insights and consumer listening has always been a priority for all marketeers. But I think never, uh, never more important than now, if we are listening to the consumers and get the right insights of where they're moving, what trends are, uh, are they moving towards and where they're likely to go. I think this, is, this will give us great insights into the opportunity, both for developing content and both for serving it at the most relevant touch points. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank Super. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so thank much you, for Shivam. having me. Uh, and uh, thank you all. Vani, it was a pleasure interacting Absolutely, with you. Absolutely, Shiva. We must catch up separately. Sure. Absolutely. So, Vani, what a diverse panel this was. Thank you for being a part of it and thank you for being the session chair. Thank you so much, Shivam, for staying till the very end and being a part of our panel.